Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Hello, everybody. The title of today's episode is When 8 Billion Light Bulbs Go On. <laughs> and you know, um, I, I want to speak about the topic of a sort of global awakening, a global uh, transition of behavior. And of course, this is a playful idea, but I, I, when I say 8 billion light bulbs go on, that means pretty much you thinking that in there were 8 billion plus you know geniuses on this planet 8 billion people who suddenly light bulbs are going on every moment for them new ideas are visiting them as them as much as they're visiting new worlds you see <coughs> alan watts um the late Alan Watts, Alan Wilson Watts, <coughs> he has a very interesting um, title of a lecture, which is called The Cosmic Network. And it's very easy to kind of get the idea of what he's talking about because he sees existence as a sort of organism. He sees... Uh, The cosmic network is a kind of as if we are like imagine your fingers came alive, became suddenly conscious, and they started asking questions. They will eventually recognize an inevitable integration and a sort of uh, integrated mode of being with all phenomena. Pretty much, we are a wave in the ocean, which is turned into conscious manifestation. What does that mean? That means an, an, a wave on the surface of the ocean. Is, is like an attempt of the whole thing to be different in the surface. It is, it is an it is a extension of nature in a unique form. That's how we find ourselves. However, we begin to recognize that there is a multidimensionality at work, a multidimensionality I often try to get the audience's attention towards, that behind our eyes we are multidimensional beings. We're considering we have a mind and a body. Okay, now we don't, the soul is still too much of a mystery. It will always remain. Nature was here first. Nature began uh, crystallizing into a sort of unique form and pattern. We can say uh, individual beings are one face of nature and the other face of nature is a collective momentary phenomenon. As if nobody can go up to another person and say, I exist more than you, bro. <laughs> like sucks laughing and taunting because the person feels he exists more. You see, existentially, we all have one value. We're in this cosmic room of manifestation, okay? We're, we are part of this cosmic network. Now, we can say that our, about, about 4 billion years it took us as a species to reach this sort of sophistication. 
That means nature managed to uh, escape itself in being the individual consciousness of mankind. We human beings are a very unique relationship of nature, and we don't recognize its uniqueness. The individual has been made into, what can I tell you? It's as if, if they, um, who was it that said that? Somebody said, if they make you ask the wrong question, they don't have to worry about your answers. That means if you're in a sort of uh, dynamic of competition with, uh, not competition, but let's say there's many beings on this planet. Some of these beings rather have everybody have their attention on, on stuff that is not as valuable. Do you know? It's as if we, um, we are sacrificing our potential to fit in a cult in a society that doesn't work. Or doesn't work for us as much as we work for it. You see, when, when, whenever a person does anything, they feel an exchange. For me, when I give these talks, there's no immediate exchange. It's just an expression. Okay? But the exchange is where the concepts take the listener. <coughs> when someone speaks, it's as if um, my attention is piloting your imagination. Conceptually, based on the sequences of concepts that arise. But when I'm trying to pretty much, like you see, uh, sometimes for me, um, something that is profound first has an emotional response within me. And that emotional response arises from the past updating. Anytime something either changes your past, breaks it, or reminds you of it, which is a new way of the past being seen, emotions arise. We are emotional creatures, guys, you know? But sometimes we don't uh, acknowledge it as much because we feel the emotions are valued. Like emotions, are. this is the unique thing. Sometimes your emotions are not meant to be for the external world. Sometimes your emotions are in the inner tool. That means, I don't know how many people on this planet are, have access to their own data. I think most people are seeking data. I feel most people want to be something they're not, and therefore their life has been stolen by a dream. There's 8 billion human beings on this planet. When we look at this on, on the surface of this rock, there seems to be no intelligent creature as able as us. <clears throat> I mean, on YouTube, I've seen elephants draw. I've literally seen elephants paint stuff. You know? <laughs> I've seen dolphins play with circular bubbles. I've seen intelligence, but I have not seen uh, the, the reach of intelligence as far as human beings. I, my mind, when I was younger, actually the world began as a spiritual place. I, my childhood, I lived it as, with a similar mindset as, as, an, as the ancient Greeks or many ancient spiritual traditions. For me, the life, life had a very significant, unique, personal color. You know, this unique, personal sense of color or meaning it had eventually changed as I came into society. This is something pretty much all children will comprehend, is that the value of the unknown excitement and potential for evolution that comes from a society is, is sometimes could be more than the individual. That means I find if you're, you, you got to see how life is treating you in every moment, and then you'll get a sense of what the data is. Sometimes you can say when the person put on their glasses, the cosmic mystical puzzle was solved. They could see what was here. And to see what is here is very important because our minds function with a sort of uh, cr chronological and linear sense of time. We have a notion that the past uh, is, is, has come to the present and the present is going into the future. Many of us function with this model. Society functions with this model. You see the way society is designed, you know, just like how some people feel like there is a social uh, explanation to consciousness. 
sociologists believe there is a social kind of something happened socially to this creature that evolved its consciousness that we can never pinpoint. Okay? So there's some people who believe that, but I'm telling you, it's not just <clears throat> before society, the child was a being. For me, children are not children. The mind cannot be contained in language, yet it is you, it expresses and receives through language. Language is like uh, the mouth and ears of, <clears throat> uh, you can say in some sense, uh, the mind. Or I've, 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 I've shaped it into a really nice sentence in, in one of my other talks where I was like, wow. Like it, <laughs> it was one of those things, like I listened to one of my old talks that I hadn't heard for like a few years, and then I said a sentence in that talk where I was like, oh my God, who is this guy speaking? <laughs> and the sentence was, language is the skin of the ego. For me, it's as if been periods of exploration or my attention, pretty much you can see my who I am as a being if, if you had access to how my attention has moved. And my attention was mainly focused on external justification. That means my inner reality. That means every right now, let's say you hear my talk and you get an impression of like what kind of person I am, okay? That impression is a momentary phenomenon. And if you were to endlessly ask me who am I, who, who I am, like who Mr. Within is, like, like the person speaking right now, I would have answers. I will give you an answer. But as time continues, as we say, as time moves forward, as change, changes, inevitable visit, <clears throat> visits us in some sense, you see there is no temporary answer to an eternally seeming existential manifest process. Okay, that means <clears throat> we can't explain existence if our consciousness seems to have a temporary physical residence here. And once the, and it's as if because our minds acknowledge a temporalness. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I'm uh, recovering from a <clears throat> uh, kind of allergy season for me. And of course, other. What I'm trying to get to is that the mind knows it will end because it thinks it's the body and it knows the body will end. But the mind is never a, bi a, a, a physical phenomenon. It is, it is what the physical has evolved to. Okay, There is something that makes us different to other animals. And it is the, that incredible ability we had to wield language and to use communication to, in some sense, enter a subtler dimension. That means we are the function of two dimensions at once, not one dimension. That's something I'm saying boldly, and I'm not talking about it in a scientific way, where like there's three dimensions you know, of space and then one of time. I'm not speaking that way. Okay, I'm not talking about a scientific approach to the separation of the world into class classes. You see, knowledge, it's very funny. You go into economy, you see some people are rich, some people are poor. You go into academia, you go into the fields of education, and you begin to see, in some sense, a sort of classification of knowledge. It's not that like we can get rid of, uh, in some sense, the class differences in society. I feel that is never possible, because as creatures, our intelligence has to classify. Sometimes you only know you're a good person because you have a reference point of something that was bad. You know, sometimes you know you're a bad person because you have a reference point of something good. And so it's, it, your intelligence is based on your uh, clarity and attention to the moment, you know? So the first stage, what I see these, uh, like, it's very funny for me. You know, I, I have this playful vision that there is a war of language going on. And there is uh, a war of, of uh, beliefs and ideal worship. That means back in the day, our ancestors, they, you know, some, they worship rocks and stone and wood and I don't know, stuff. Eventually, some people came to them and they were like, what are you guys doing? It can't be the stuff, you know? There was, there was the religious story of Abraham, who, Abraham, who evidently, like, <clears throat> where the Kaaba is, where Mecca is, is a very important place. You know, it's not just for Islam, for the history of the world, you know. Because it was where the idols of man were broken, and for the first time, men doubted their gods. As if there was, it was very fascinating for me. Um, 
some atheists, such as uh, Christopher Hitchens, taunted. They say it was as if they were getting closer to the truth by many gods becoming one god, and now in, in our current society, there's no such thing as God. The, the, uh, Frederick Nietzsche made a bold claim. He did something sly. I consider this was a <coughs> sly gesture of Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, this German philosopher He's the guy who comes up with the quote, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. He's, he's an incredible philosophical force uh, in our history. You know, it's as if like what writers have been doing, what philosophers have been doing, were in, in some sense exploring the inner realm. Philosophers are just like, just like how, like we have explorers that searched and found new worlds, you know, physical parts of the planet, they, they discovered it. Similarly, Friedrich Nietzsche discovered and explored various ways the state of man was being put into a story. That's pretty much anybody who becomes a philosopher when they wonder about the story of life. It's kind of strange. I always wondered it, you know. Many people have spoken, spoken about the shaman, uh, the shaman. I don't know how they exactly pronounce it, but... Um, Pretty much that guy in ancient kind of Native American tribes who would stay away from the tribe and would, would live by the foot of the mountain. And he would come to the city every, like, I don't know, every couple months and he would speak to everybody in the city and he would be that person who in some sense uh, <clears throat> would be outside of the problems of society, entering society and sharing views pretty much, having conversations. The beautiful thing about philosophy, and I find this is where original, originality and creativity are discovered, when you get bored of repetition, when you get bored of, of the past, because you see it's already past, like, sometimes I wonder why, like, this, this is an incredibly profound question, you know, what I'm going to say, and it's like, what is the purpose of memory? Memory seems to be some sort of color palette that we use into being a person, okay? And sometimes the mind is, in, instead of me saying, uh, like, you know, your <clears throat> your personality is, um, let me say it like this, and your body is local, your mind is non-local. Instead of non-local, I would say it's multi-local. That means it's like, <clears throat> there's an intersection of many ways that intelligence is present that we are suddenly saying this is us. We are, we are, we are, it's like our sim simplicity and complexity, believe it or not, never exists. Like, for example, Frederick Nietzsche wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil, and it's this incredible long volume of his vision. But I can tell you, Beyond Good and Evil is in some sense the death of the world. It is, it is, the, it is leaving one room of how reality and society and the matrix of matter has to be valid. So you find your free will in a jungle where every idea is trying to make your free will a slave to its cause. Every idea. This is why you, I, I constantly tell people you're not thoughts and you're not language. You use language. Language is a technology. It is just like how <coughs> the sun gives off light beams, the human mind produces language or, or has the ability to at least generate it in incredibly complex ways. That means when we, this is, this is the story of humanity, guys. This is our true history. We first looked outside as beings and we found human beings. We found that we're human beings. But when we looked inside and when we wondered about the ability of the mind and sometimes the innate and inherent potential vastness of imagination, you know, the mind, it's like you don't know. Everybody has an incredible imagination. It's, it's that they haven't explored it. They haven't... Um, uh, uh, move through that safari of conceptualization yet. How you hold yourself as a self is how the world has either held you or you are holding the world. In, my, in today's society, it's as if, like, let me tell you what happened. We, had, we pretty much had a generation of kids grow up 
and <clears throat> being told that the world should be a better place. As they made mistakes of not keeping it a better place, they cultivated guilt and resentment towards their free will's decision making. There are moments that you cannot just love your mind, which is a state of samadhi, but you, you can hate your mind. Depression arises when you've gotten beat. Let me tell you, violence happens when some no being is ever violent. We are attributeless, kind of empty slates of, of, of minds, I'm telling you. And as we take shape, as we are fed not just food by our parents, we're, f we're fed... Uh, uh, ideas and ways of belief and living and seeing by the future generations, we forget who we are. It's as if that kid in the library has to make a huge choice. Does he learn, does he want to learn from the world of the past or does he want to learn from the world that is now? And the young child who dwells in the past will eventually understand the value. Do you believe it? It's like past and future are metaphors for heaven and hell. Because it's all about the value of something that can be lost or not. This is why Frederick Nietzsche even, he has quotes where he says, there are no facts, only interpretations. He says, he who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. That means once you, the why questions of your existential self-aware, self-inquiry are answered, then the how becomes not important. Like, it's like once you understand the design of a technology, you know, you can use that technology and it's like a breath of fresh air. There is a very pleasant, integrative relationship with man and machine. The reason I started, believe it or not, writing science fiction um, is actually because I thought it's important to establish the potential relationships that can arise between man, technology, and nature. These are these, this technology, think of it this way. Back in the day, they said in certain religious contexts, there was an angel and a devil on your shoulder. I don't know which one was on which. Let me actually do this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the devil was on the left, but I don't know. <laughs> Angel and devil on shoulder. Yeah, I think I got it right. A shoulder angel devil is a plot device often used for comic or dramatic effect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the angel represents conscience, and uh, and devil is represented by temptation. <clears throat> so pretty much, just like how there is on the left shoulder, like the kind of the inefficient voice that tells you go for your desire, it's like on your right shoulder. There's the efficient voice that tells you in some sense, remember how you have walked so far. You know, remember, what there's a part of you that is constantly telling you to remember who you are, and there's a part of you that is constantly telling you to forget who you are, so you, you go towards the fulfillment of, of, a, of a future expectation. <clears throat> the, I mean, this is a representation of the inner conflict of a character. So similar to that, you can say the future and uh, the past are on your shoulders. And they are ways that your intelligence functions and you choose. It's very hard to get out of your conditioning because you will eventually reach the edges of trying to get out of your childhood conditioning and you'll suddenly see that to you, how can I tell you? you You are trying to make your emo your emotional self uh, conquers your intellectual self. 
that's when desires are are your birthright. Okay, when you're in, when you are emotional, your intelligence is maintained by your emotional data, that by your emotional sense of being, rather than your uh, abstract, conceptualized kind of linear, safe way of being. You have to pilot your intelligence. I use a term. I created a term actually. I call it. Like I don't, I don't, I don't use the word meditators or like mist. Like I, I speak about mystics, um, but more as a frame of mind. <clears throat> I see people. I have to. I see two kinds of audiences. Like anybody who's who's grafting with these Mr. Rabin talks. Uh, I, I'm pretty much saying I see human beings as an, either advanced communicators or pilots of consciousness. I see nothing else except these. It's not that I don't see nothing. I choose to acknowledge these two positions because the advancement of communication requires the navigation of our planes of existence. That means I notice something that is more valuable than money and words. It is the echo of ideas that are efficient. Guys, I will tell you a true story. And incredibly something I experienced okay so I was raised in Iran it was a kind of Shia Muslim experience until the age of seven I came to Canada long story short I went back and forth uh, but I start but I but my family came to Canada and I lived in Canada a lot but I traveled to different countries and I remember I went to Italy and I was visiting a friend um, a family friend I was staying with a family friend and we go into this pizza place uh, in Italy and the pizza place was run by Egyptian people and there was like there was a video like there was a TV in the pizza place that was showing um, what do you call it was showing Mecca, uh, uh, Mecca so they were Muslim Egyptians in Italy and this was in a place called Mozate Italy where I stayed there for a couple of months not a couple of months a couple of weeks but uh, as I was there so I go into this pizza place and I order the pizza, you know. Uh, and it, it, they had this unique thing called pizza kebab, where they would put kebab on pizza, you know. What happened was, uh, I get the pizza, I talk to them, I see um, we suddenly have conver I have some sort of broken English kind of conversation with the Egyptian guy, you know, uh, who, who, like the Egyptian guy didn't know English, but he knew enough, a few words to understand him. So as I was talking to him, I um, told him that uh, I, I went to Mecca when I was like 12 or something. And... Uh, I, like I kind of talked to the guy, but I started eating the pizza in like I in the place and I used my left hand Then the guy came and said something to my friend You know and he said something to, to him in Italian and my friend turned back to me And he said he's telling me like the guy was telling me he's like don't eat with your left hand That's the sign of like the devil, you know <laughs> And I told him and I told my friend to tell that guy, you know, it was, it was a very intense moment as if somebody telling you not to use the hand you've naturally chosen to eat with, you know. <laughs> and I told the guy, tell him that, but God created both hands to be used, right? <laughs> and my friend tells it to the guy, and I see the guy is too in his belief to see otherwise. As if somebody becomes your best friend the moment you believe the same stuff as them. But the moment you don't, they're the inquisitor being like, well, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> so it was one of those situations. And so I, I, I didn't care and like use my right hand. And I'm like, you know, I, I, it was a very strange situation. But it baffled me. It baffled me on some level. I used my right hand to just end the guy's the disturbance in the guy's mind, but at the same time, it was like such an existential question for me. Look at how powerful beliefs are. 
it, it, it's not that they make good people evil or make evil people good. It's just the fact that there is a mask upon the reality in, this, in, a, in a form of language, a linguistic uh, duplicate of the world, as if, if you the moment uh, you read the dictionary, suddenly everything you saw had a word to it. You know, had a subjective existence. The best way to kind of, I find, approach education is to inspire in the student their own search for clarity. This search is so crucial because children think that edu the educational system must give them everything, but the educational system must wake up. It's as if there there is a, a from idol worship, we, it, we've come to ideal worship, and what that means is every child that is being born by the age of 14, will have enough ideas uh, consumed to be an individual character in their mind. That is the, like, you don't understand, a child is born twice. And we, we all of us right now functioning in society are, have been born twice and we will die twice. <clears throat> and it's very interesting because a subjective death can come sooner than a physical. The death of language is the silencing of the mind. Once your mind stops, it suddenly sees how the world is moving, how everything else is moving. But the moment your mind is moving, searching for that truth, it cannot reach it. it even if it reaches it, it won't be pure. So it's like one of those things where <clears throat> our society is all about which neighborhoods you choose to enter and what neighborhoods there are. That means if we just had one, at least one nation on a planet, suddenly understanding the, the role model effect, that we are all, all just like how, I, when I see nations, I, when I saw all the UN, I was like, this is kids in a classroom. That's the United Nations, kids in a classroom. They're all kids. We all are, because our memories extend that far. So that means we have not only a very complex sort of subjective database of imagery, but in those imagery there are emotions. And it, every moment is the creation of meaning, strangely. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's like this funny thing I say, the word VIP can stand, could stand for two different things. You know, a very important person or a very uh, ignorant person. What that means is sometimes <clears throat> when our own beliefs become important, we forget the world. Imagine like you had 8 billion plus family members and pretty much with most of them you couldn't get along or would have never a chance to get to know. It's kind of like the spirit of life in a battlefield. Our free will has two abilities. It can either engineer or reverse engineer. It reverse engineers meaning when it becomes more inactive. It chooses to act less, to express the free will less. Okay, when you, when you don't uh, train your freedom, your freedom of mind is something you got to cultivate. You cultivate it by experiential uh, attainment of experience. You know, <laughs> so what I mean by experiential attainment, it, 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 that means you... You, you are getting an experience through going by going through an experience okay and as like this it's like and it's like your greatest effort and the challenge it has to go through it's like the moment of that contact the contact of the simple and the complex having a sort of inseparability to the notion of self and world that means is the world in our heads or are our heads in the world 
evolution suggests our heads are in the world. You know, metaphysics and spiritual traditions suggest that the world is in our heads. That means your eyes right now, before you gave them the language, if they are nature's intelligence. And nature's intelligence has been tried to be extracted through different stories, and this is why the language war exists. Because all of us have had different results when we've tried to interpret the unknown. And we think that we have to fight over our results. But at rather, we must have uh, a, coin, a sort of battle arena of the greatest ideas, so the most greatest, greatest ideas are revealed. As if the two, the two, this is why back in the day, enemies weren't something you would kill your enemy. It wouldn't be something like that to, uh, um, in regards to a great warrior's caliber. As if the warrior would spare his enemy who had allowed him to, in some sense, go uh, levels beyond himself. You know, we find this for an example. Example of this would be, for example, the relationship that Vegeta and Goku have in Dragon Ball Z, this animation film. So you see, <clears throat> the relationship these two characters have is that at first they were enemies, but as they challenged one another and both of them reached the peak of their ability and kept going further, they became friends in the evolution of power. They became comrades in the war of the efficiency of where they're headed, right? So it's as if, like, you, 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 uh, Gal Galileo, I'm oh, sorry, not Galileo, um, um, uh, Machiavelli understood this. He has a saying where he says, um, uh, let me see what, how, how is it, um, he says, A mind that has an enemies remains sharp, like something like that. Like once you have that saber tooth level of alertness throughout the day, you would suddenly notice things more sooner. For me, it's it's like I am either being a mind that's moving a body, and I'm either being a body that is moving my mind. And what I mean is that. I don't believe that you can believe your mind or body alone. I believe there's an oscillation between a multidimensional uh, setting. It's as if you are you're being nothing and you're oscillating between existence and non-existence all the time. Think of it in the same visual sense that when you're looking at something, you blink. Like as I've been giving this talk, maybe I've had like I don't know two hundred, like maybe like two hundred times I've blinked or something. I don't know. So. <laughs> So, so in each of those, like when you just close your eyes for a moment, the world is gone, but it appears. The world is gone, it appears. It's gone, it appears, you see? And so the, your mind suddenly is, is having this constant different parts of it. It's intelligence, kind of. Think of it this way. Um, when your eyes close, a sort of wave occurs in your brain, and when your eyes open, a different part of your brain suddenly. Up. So as different parts of your brain are constantly lighting up, the brain is, is in some sense being in some com complex uh, workout of self-generation self and world generation. So pretty much what I'm saying is that when you become the world that is moving your body, you have reached the sort of um, evolution of your mind beyond language, beyond even the language that the world needs to be. You see, direct experience is, is to be honest, the last staircase of heaven the last door left to open. That means after you've read all the philosophies imagined, let's say you were a person who suddenly in an instant got access uh, to all knowledge. Let's say even something more interesting. Let's say that in a, in a sci-fi kind of setting, I remember I wrote a story. Um, where I spoke about how our society in the future could evolve potentially to a place where suddenly technology begins replacing biology. So we see somebody suddenly they can make a biological, they can have a biological arm and suddenly their skills and ability are like, man, 
suddenly you see you can make your your eventually I think just like how plastic surgery took over the Hollywood housewife's mind, you know, like it that kind of destruction approach to that being. Similarly, people are going to have that with technology, and they're going to start replacing their uh, biological expression of consciousness towards a technological one. Eventually, the being will change their body to such a point that we will be robots acting like humans, physical, physically robots acting uh, like humans in a programmed human way. You know. Uh, we lose our humanity if the unknown is is ignored. That's pretty much it. You stop evolving when you are content with your knowledge. When you don't want to know anymore. Do you see? This is why, on some level, no human being could have ever been a teacher, because they're all still learning. Do you see? So we are just comrades in a battlefield, where we have to now like blocks, like how children play with blocks, be able to constantly reshape civilization's ambitions towards efficiency and clarity. There should be this call, like as if suddenly 8 billion people are like, holy shit, if we were all decent and worked efficiently, what could we do, you know? It's like that That dream is, uh, is, is very unique. So anyways, what I'm trying to get to is that in my, uh, it, 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 this is a part of, um, it's called the story, it's called Project 12. Okay, Project 12 is the script where I kind of explain it to you pretty much human beings have become robots acting like humans and one, one robotic human is asking another robotic human uh, for marriage, okay? And then they sing it going to a simulation where they're as human beings to decide if they're compatible. It's so unique and stuff like that. But, but anyways, what I'm trying to get to is that similarly, we, we should not replace the experiencer with language. The moment you do that, you are uh, you are walking as a bewildered beast. You have to be able to acknowledge your mind or your still nature, while the body of Nick, like, you understand what I mean? Your free will is something where you have to choose how you stand. Nobody can tell you how to stand. You do it. You see? That's, that's, the, that's the idea there. So, one part of this planet begins behaving with uh, internal permission not to just limit its potential to what the past wants. As if we, we forget the past for a moment and we wonder of the potential future we could make from, from scratch. It's as if um, there comes a moment where 8 billion and plus human beings are all suddenly themselves and as they are great communication provides this kind of integrated network of vision so we will have a way of getting the greatest ideas <coughs> <coughs> to the global stage to the influences <coughs> but this kind of way of kind of society I'm kind of talking about I don't think it will come about until we choose to express our intelligence through different patterns. And I don't know how that will happen. I feel we're going to this crossroad where we're gonna either go towards our technological desire or we will in some sense find the humility of nature and walk that way. I don't know how far the evolutionary re uh, return to nature will, will occur. But I know that it, it will occur based on uh, what excites the being. And what excites the being has to do with how you have considered your, yourself as a person. Okay, your creativity all has to do with how you have considered your, yourself as a person and how that person thinks the world should be. You know, writer's block occurs because the person is trying to be so specific that they think nothing else. They have one idea and they see it doesn't work, they be suddenly wonder, like they sit on the couch wondering, oh my God, what I did. I had this when I was... Uh, <laughs> When I was like in 2011, I remember I was sitting on my friend's couch and this was in Europe and, uh, sorry, not my friend's couch, my cousin, my, my close cousin's couch. 
uh, in London. Uh, my kid's building was beside Chelsea Bridge, and I was there, and I remember I, I had taken Molly, and like I was <laughs> a bit uh, intoxicated, like I, I drank a bit, and I remember I was I, I was watching the show Californication then, right? And I was really into the writings of Charles Bukowski, who, you know, like, <clears throat> and when I was in, the, in that kind of mindset, I would just get drunk and try to write. And I remember I, it took me like an hour, and <laughs> I noticed it never works when you drink and write because you only drink <laughs> until you can't no, no longer write. And so, so I, I kind of went through a situation where I managed to write a sentence, and I wrote something called the black horse. And the black horse was this idea of, of like existence moving towards an abyss, you know, this sort of inevitable experience that all beings will go through and but I, I it was it was very limiting it was something where um, <clears throat> truth is the clearest artist is the greatest artist that's it any artwork that shines a light on uh, more of the picture wins you know There's, <clears throat> I'll tell you something funny, guys. The reason I'm writing my uh, science fiction, <clears throat> the reason I'm writing science fiction is because I, I want to write a story that I feel if AI and super intelligence comes about, will agree, and if it chooses to be violent, will spare you. So I've, I'm writing my audience as an AI in the future, okay? So that's that's the inspiration of the novel. I'm writing this for an AI, you know, the kind of super intelligent computer, in the in like beyond the year fifty-seven or something. <clears throat> and so this novel, in it, in it, the reason I how can I tell you? It's like I want to show how human beings tr could treat technology as if it was their children how they would care for robotic life and try to animate it in a way where we found all the good, the good ways of being that we could not be in our creation. You see, the most valuable thing in our species has been reproduction. Nobody's stupid when they look at sex. The idea of sex, everybody understands. You know? <clears throat> this idea is the primal force of the biological continuation of the species. And it's such an important task where the manner, it's not just like important for global minds to restructure society into efficient ways. You, we are all building the future by our decisions. And even not deciding, you're building, you're choosing the future to be in. Everybody has a potential value when it comes into a social setting. What that means is you choose how, like, a person's mind decides uh, um, the depth of the world, you know. Human beings can work with technology, <clears throat> and how can I tell you, this is the idea we should have. Rather than thinking we are the prime rulers of this planet, we should suddenly have this in incredible uh, wave of humility into the species, where we start acknowledging the, our limits as a species. And we find the moment we find our limits, we can we can now have limitless exploration. The moment you see your weakness is the moment you can find your strength.
believe it or not, it doesn't matter how weak or strong you are in this life, the mind, if it is not realized, will torment. Will torment the character in the story. Because the whole point of the character in the story is like how a caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly, how an individually conscious physical idea remembers it never was an idea. That is when you, you enter the eternal fields of vision. It doesn't mean you're eternal yet. It means you, 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 can, you can see eternal value in the temporary. You see that it's hilarious. It's a paradox. You know, we say we're temporary beings, but existence eternally happens, you know? <laughs> so like, it's like matter is more eternal than we are. <laughs> That's how temporary we think. And it's a fallacy. It's a fallacy which either must be, you must, you must change the mind of the world by either roaring at it, <clears throat> or in some sense, just asking it why it's not there on its own. A question is such a powerful thing. A question is from emptiness and ability for worlds to open. In 2019, I will testify society is a machine. It is a machine because the people functioning in that society and keeping that society, this global society I'm speaking of, in other words, I'm talking about that what I'm saying applies to every society in existence. That's, that's the way I'm speaking about it. Because it is minds choosing design that will suggest what kind of designs will happen. It is, it is where our attention is at that will suggest our when our extinction comes. So this inner responsibility to free yourself from ways that you think you have to be or the future has to be and just be in the present moment, you will suddenly see you can't have stress or depression or any of these abstract ailments where every time when I see uh, like I, 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 I search it on YouTube, people talking about like psychological illness and I, I, I find it okay. Like I do, I do acknowledge the cruel roots of the, the psych, a psych, a psychology's effort. But I understand at the same time that there were honest men who asked questions in a very linear way about how the mind works. They eventually came to the conclusion uh, especially through the efforts of Carl Jung, that it is it works through archetypes. What that means is how you're being a person right now is not that you're actually being one person, you're being an awareness of your greatest image. And that greatest image is an archetype. That means when I speak, especially, I thought I could avoid it, but in some sense, uh, you can't. You can't avoid, uh, the like, any time a being speaks, that sound their speech makes, it cannot be avoided. You, like, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, internally we're multidimensional, externally we're not. But because internally we're multidimensional and the meaning of the world we assume arises from our brain, then in some sense a multidimensional phenomenon is, is wondering about a temporary phenomenon, a singular phenomenon. <clears throat> So guys, I'm gonna do something exciting. I'm gonna put a Charles Bukowski um, video for you to hear. And uh, it's one of his poems, which I think is called Go All The Way, or All The Way. And uh, I need a small interme intermission in the middle of this, but I don't wanna stop the
Here's the, <clears throat> the link to the video. The exploration of our minds is as important as the exploration of the body. When you look at the body and anything that relates to the body, you are Im immediately and instantly teleported to a way of looking at life where things, be things are occurring through uh, a sort of relationship. Um, it's as if your body is existing through limits and conditions of certain processes that are occurring. So it's as if the laws of nature have incredible importance in regards to how, how, how healthy you can become. As you abide by the rhythms of nature, your health becomes incredibly, um, uh, you become healthy. You become healthy because you, you are acknowledging the world and its rhythms. These rhythms are like, it's not just only rock stars on like in huge concerts have these moments where they're in the zone. You know, it's many people. It's as if you can grow, you can always be in the zone when there's enough value to be so. Like you become stressed and depressed, you know what the first symptom of stress and depression is? Life is no longer important for you. Yeah, it's as if you're being like this spoiled creature that's suffering, and so you're like, it's not worth it. You know, but it's as if you are choosing to dramatize an emotion. Pretty much think of it this way, like anthropologists went to different tribes, like, you know, and tried to discover their, uh, 
behavior, tried to explore and study their behavior. And eventually, they began to realize the primitive mind is, has savageness. That means even, even it's like how you physically live dictates the savageness of your thoughts. And some person could be like especially young children who are in violent environments or savage families or something. In those environments, the child will be peaceful and quiet, but its mind is recording images of savageness and violence. And eventually, when someone is exposed too much to some sort of data, eventually they will choose to identify with the data. Either they have to keep their attention moving from thoughts to thought, or they will be, in some sense, defined by that thought. So we have to find, we have to free matter from how our minds only choose it to see it in a certain way. And this is a sort of establishment of a mark like you would see, like some movies captured this incredibly well, like Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon. In that movie, the way the masters behaved were as if they were in, a, in, they were in abidance with the flow of the world. It's, it, even in Star Wars, this theme was there, where suddenly they said, the force is strong in this person or whatever, right? What that meant is destiny has chosen that being to continue in that moment and others have not. Do you see? That's, that's how the Jedi knew he had the Force. Because the Jedi knew how long he would be in existence. So he would know how long the forces of the world would keep him in this field. You see, it's, it's as if it followed that sort of mentality. You know, and of course, modern science fiction sometimes is the echoes of ancient or actual past uh, historical ideas. It's like the most important question for all of us to ask is how important should knowledge be and how important should the exploration of the unknown be we, we have never had a chance to con be consciously evolved creatures with such sophistication to ever attempt the question is as if we are eight billion beings never wondering about the efficiency of the overall movement and that efficiency is the responsibility this is the difference in uh, ancient like not ancient but like buddha in Buddhist philosophy, there's the word concept, the word Buddha, and then there's the concept of the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva and the Buddha had in common the ultimate enlightened state. That means they were completed beings in, in their evolutionary path. They had, they, 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 had, they had attained the ultimate and they were both the ultimate. However, the Buddha was going from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. That means the Buddha was evolving like a caterpillar beyond this physical world, but the Bodhisattva was that which came from the ultimate down. And the Bodhisattva was, it was is, is a very unique idea because they are here to live for, the, for now, like they're trying to enlighten the body of society, the body of civilization. They've come back for one being that is how all of us are together as one. You see, it is, it, is, it is how we are being sculpted, our knowledge is sculpted by the unknown, okay? We, we are, that's the, you have to be, you have to have enough of a men, um, inner strength to be able, able, able to acknowledge that emptiness because the unknown is beyond emptiness. That means knowledge has, is, is like this oscillation, this kind of like vibration between two different polar positions of how the universe is kept as if there's these two universal, um, it's like your, your, your first philosophy of how the universe is kept, okay? There's two modes of that where the mind moves. One is that this temporary phenomena, in some sense, will in some sense reach emptiness, and then there's this idea, this temporary phenomena will reach the opposite of emptiness which is this notion which has been colored by various ideologies as eternal life or the abodes beyond.
the new age community has the energy to do the job, but not the right idea, not the right, uh, is not looking at the right place. Uh, mainstream media wants to give freedom, yet it is wondering if there is a sort of like nuclear war of various ideologies occurring to have what content is exposed to uh, the children of the future generations. As if everybody's trying to be in the one spotlight, so there has come this incredible competitive domain where art is being sacrificed for competitive victory. If you choose to see yourself as a temporary individual objective being, if you get bored of that, you will wonder about the opposite. If you choose to see the opposite, you get bored, you will wonder about the opposite. It all has to do with how we as beings are processing data, okay? And the way I feel data is being processed by our intelligence is in, it's being witnessed fundamentally as a moment of attention and being. In the, from this moment of attention being comes all the potential of how you will respond to various moments throughout life. The moment is something where you have to see it yourself. Then you'll see it yourself. So guys, I, I feel this is as far as I can share about society's evolution towards its efficient vision. Feel that there's a rush of ability and excitement one gets from suddenly finding it out a way to evolve things. Because in boredom, we are suffocating our imagination. We have to be actually interested in life to function well in it. That means, uh, I think, a person's like, a person can live a whole day not being themselves. And as they come home, just like they put their hat and jacket on, like their coat hanger or whatever, like, they at the same time put aside the idea of who they want to work. This is why when you see somebody working, when they suddenly are in front of their boss or their manager or the company, they're suddenly somebody else. They're abiding with the professionalism, of course. But in that professionalism, they're true. Uh, sense of being is, is, has been masked, has been masked by a sort of behavioral uh, repetition. And that's the problem with um, pretty much um, any sort of community, how real the human beings are. Because every, it's, it's easy to be fake. It's like, um, I remember I was uh, talking to filmmaker friends of mine, and we were having a very interesting conversation about creativity and its depth, you know? And it was like we came into this conclusion that freedom of mind is the most important right of any being. That means not just physically you be free, like hopefully we will attain that com completely as a civilization, but freedom of mind. Do you know in how many countries right now, as I'm speaking, children do not have freedom of mind? Even if they choose to, imagine you're a great artist in a city, in a, in a country where you are drawing the most unique artwork, but the country doesn't like the artwork. The, the ideology that governs the nations has been limited to the choices of a few men. And that's when, as if few, like few personalities are dictating, uh, the, all, an oligarchy is 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 uh, uh, an oligarchy is the mass destruction of many individuals' inner cre creative freedom. We have to seek freedom of ideology. When we find that freedom, it'll be like we found an empty battlefield. That empty battlefield, there's no war yet. 
And as many different groups come into the same place, you know, where they were promised something, they will eventually fight. You see, so in some sense, the martial artists had an incredible ability to fight that martial art master in movies, you know, but he chose to keep it dormant. He chose to, he had understood enough about the laws of the universe that he in some sense understood the universe doesn't like uh, in rudeness towards your world is insin insincerity. The moment you're insincere in front of another human being is the, mo is the moment you have become, in, in, your mind has become a robot. It has, it has become the mask is, has, as you were, like, as if you put on a mask, you look in the mirror, you think you're the mask, like, 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 get out of here. <laughs> that, that notion is very important. Ideas are masks for images. Uh, sorry, words are masks for images. So, guys, I'll open it up to some sort of, you know, public discussion q a there's two people watching um i feel this global awakening will go towards either nature or technology what do you guys think Uh, quote by uh, let me find it actually here. Okay, let's go through a quote tunnel. <laughs> Ramana Marshi says your own self-realization is the greatest service you can render the world. He says Happiness is your nature. It is not wrong to desire it. What is wrong is seeking it outside when it is, when it is inside. Your duty is to be and not to be this or that. I am that I am. Sums up the whole truth. I am that I am. Sums up the whole truth. The method is summed up in the, in, in the words, be still. But what does stillness mean? It means destroy yourself. Because any form or shape is the cause for trouble. Give up the notion that I am so and so. All that is required is to realize the self is to be, all that is required to realize the self is to be still. What can be easier? Ramana Maharshi says, whatever is destined not to happen, will not happen. Try as you may. Whatever is destined to happen, will happen. Do what you may to prevent it. This is certain. The best course, therefore, is to remain silent. Wanting to reform the world without discovering one's true self is like trying to cover the world with leather to avoid the pain of walking on stones and thorns. It is much simpler to wear shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And that's exactly it, guys. Roman and Marge, you just got this right. Wanting to reform the world without discovering one's true self. You have to, you have to do that first. That individual enlightenment will then align you to what's collectively. Roman and Marge, she says, have faith in God and in yourself. That will cure all. Hope for the best. Expect the best. Toil for the best and everything will come right for you. And look, everything will come right for you. And yeah. I mean, that's a very inspirational point. Yeah. <laughs> Roman Washi says, there's neither creation nor destruction, neither destiny nor free will, neither path nor achievement. This is the final truth. Yeah, this is the truth and tr truth is truth mindset when it arrives, when the world is seen as one. Rona Marshi says, you can only stop the flow of thoughts by refusing to have any interest in it. Yeah. Where, where your attention goes, your world is designed in some detail. He says, there's neither past nor future, there's only the present. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's true. He says if the mind falls asleep, awaken it. Then if it starts wandering, make it quiet. If you reach the state where there is neither sleep nor movement of mind, stay still in that, the natural real state. Realization is not accusant, acu, acu, <laughs> Realization is not acquisition of anything new, nor is it a new faculty. It is only removal. It is all. It is only removal of all camouflage. Yeah, he says all that is required to realize the self is to be still. He says, eventually, all that one has learned will have to be forgotten. He says, aim high, aim at the highest, and all lower aims are thereby achieved. It is looking below on the stormy sea of differences that make you sink, that makes you sink. It is looking below on the, on the stormy sea of differences that makes you sink. Uh, look up beyond these and see the one glorious real, and you are saved. Look up your own. Yeah, guys, it, it, this notion Shira what Maharshi is saying is like everything you just heard is many people all over the planet have, have come to this ultimate conclusion when they've kind of went exploring the depth of their mind. They came to this realization that you have to be still to see how the truth is moving. The moment you move, you have chosen to be you know, walk the Bodhisattva. The moment you're still, you have walked, chosen to walk the Buddha. Do you see? Robert Marshi says, the greatest error of a man is to think that he is weak by nature, evil by nature. Every man is divine and strong in his real nature. What are we weak and evil? Oh, sorry. What, what are weak and evil are his habits, his desires and thoughts, but not himself. Evil is not you, and neither is good, so who are you? <laughs> That's kind of like the mystical Buddhist school. He says, Roman Marshall says, let what come, come, let what goes, go. Find out what comes. Yeah. You, like, for, for example, when you find yourself in an intense situation throughout the day, just try this. Let what's happening just happen for a bit, and then let what comes to you and leaves, let it go. And then just see what remains. It's like this kind of sort of context to the story of the world, whereby you not chasing after everything, you're kind of trying to see what has remained and what is the true pure intelligence. You reach a state where it's not that your thoughts are pure, or you are a pure thought, or this biological intelligence has had an ability to consider itself as purely thought.
as Ramana Maharshi says, time is only an idea. There is only the reality, whatever you think it is, it looks like that. If you call it time, it is time. If you call it existence, it is existence, and so on. After calling it time, you divide it into days and nights, months, years, hours, minutes. Time is immaterial for the path of knowledge, but some of these rules and disciplines are good for beginners. He says, know that the eradication of the identification with the body is charity, spiritual austerity and ritual sacrifice. It is virtue, divine union and devotion. It is heaven, wealth, peace and truth. It is grace. It is the state of divine silence. It is the deathless death. It is janana, renunciation, final liberation and bliss. So he's saying you eradicate the identi way you identify with your body uh, it, through charity. That means it, it kind of like not having a preference, being kind if it can be. And then he says spiritual austerity. That means find, be abiding by your true self. And then he says ritual sacrifice, which means you in some sense have the notion of past of time is gone. Okay. And he says it is virtue, divine union and devotion. It is heaven, wealth, peace, and truth. It is grace. It is the state of divine silence. It is the deathless death. It is Janana, renunciation, final liberation, and bliss. So when he says it's divine silence and it's a deathless death, that's, that's kind of him saying it's the remembrance of the eternal. That's the deathless death. That means the idea of death dies before you do. And so you suddenly see the whole picture or something. <laughs> And he says that's you know eventually takes you to bliss, because in ancient Indian tradition there's an idea called Satchidananda, which means conscious existence is bliss. Any moment of being just becomes aware that existence is conscious or consciousness is being existence. There comes a bliss, an oscillating bliss, which becomes a sort of samadhi, an ultimate with the alignment with your planet, not with your planet, with your universal sector or your existential sphere or. Your existential sphere is the what amount of existence you or you can individually be aware of. Okay, that means none of us have access to the whole data, and even if the whole data was revealed to us, uh, we couldn't process it. And so, pretty much, what happens when you can't process too much data? You become chaos. The chaotic nature is an evil. Roman War, she says, "We're you guys, um, we're quote tumbling here. This is a." concept I've created where I just read a list of quotes <laughs> of one person, yeah. He says, um, Ramana Maharshi says, what is illusion? As if somebody asked Ramana Maharshi, like, what is illusion? That is such a, such a profound question. What is illusion? And he says, to whom is the illusion? Find it out. Then illusion will vanish. Generally, people want to know about illusion and do not examine to whom it is. It is foolish. Illusion is outside and unknown, but the seeker is considered to be known that it is inside. Find out what is immediate, intimate, instead of trying to find out what is distant and unknown. <laughs> yes, guys, I, I, let me tell you how I understand what he said. Ramana Marsh is kind of saying, because it's like it's very common sense when you look outside and you see that it's like this endless unknown and if you think you're illusion it's, it's as if like there's this endless universe of data okay so as long as you're chasing for a truth of that it will be kind of elusive it will be the, it, 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 inevitable it will be foolish foolish you know what a foolishness can be defined as somebody trying to push a building a building, you know, <laughs> you know, like similar to that, it's an, it, it, like what another person has seen the inevitable inefficiency of action before the person acts. So in some sense, he says, find out what is immediate, intimate, instead of trying to find out what is distant and unknown. And of course, he, I think what he's, like the way he's saying it is a bit different, uh, but he's saying it as if like, get to know who you are and then try to see what everything is, right? That's what he's saying. 
But if you're trying to see what everything is before knowing who you are, whatever you find has nowhere to go. So that's the foolishness of it. Okay? But just let's assume that we reach that point where we find our true self and we get out of the illusion. What will truth do? The Bodhisattva might have answers. <laughs> um, but it's a very important thing he says. He says illusion is outside and unknown. Yes, but if the unknown exists, then knowledge seems to be an illusion as well. The, the abstract sense of knowledge. Ramana Maharshi says, become conscious of being conscious. Say or think, I am and add nothing to it. Be aware of the stillness that follows the I am. Sense your presence, the naked unveiled, unclothed beings. It is untouched by young or old, rich or poor, good or bad, or any other attributes. It is the spacious womb of all creation, all four. He says, if you hold this feeling of I long enough and strongly enough, the false I will vanish leaving only the unbroken awareness of the real, imminent I, consciousness itself. So he's saying if you pay attention, have this single-pointed attention on who are you, if you just wonder about who you are and just keep your attention there, eventually there will come this silence and there will be enough of your attention constantly wondering about it that the false sense of you will vanish. And you have to, you, you will come into this unbroken awareness of the real. So you are sacrificing the illusory self for the real self by confronting the directness of the unknown, by stopping trying to have some sort of search or excavation for it, but you're just coming into this present moment. And when you're in the present moment, the linguistic uh, uh, simulation of reality stops. That's why I'm telling you you're not a thought. Right? <laughs> He says, I'll read it again, he says, if you hold this feeling of I long enough and strongly enough, the false I will vanish, leaving only the unbroken awareness of the real, imminent I, consciousness itself. You become consciousness um, uh, in which matter is, is within you. Okay, you become pretty much the whole moment of being. It's, it's very unique, you know. Um, he says, remain still with the conviction that the self shines as everything yet nothing, within, without, and everywhere. He says, when one remains without thinking, one understands another by means of the universal language of silence. The pure mind is itself Brahman. It therefore follows that Brahman is not other than the mind of the sage. The only useful purpose of the present birth is to turn within and realize the self. I'm going to give a high, like, you know, you know, subjective high five. He says the explorers seek happiness and finding curiosities, discovering new lands and undergoing risks and adventures. They are thrilling, but where is pleasure found? Only within. Pleasure is not to be sought in the external world. He says your concentration must come as easy as the breath. Fix yourself on one thing and try to hold on to it. All will come right. Meditation is sticking to one thought. That single thought keeps away other thoughts. The dissipated mind is a sign of its weakness. By constant meditation, it gains strength. Guys, before I end off, there's a quote by Buckminster Fuller. He says, we never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to Nelson.